before we get started, I'd like to give a visual description of myself. Um, I'm a queer, disabled, Asian American woman who is sitting in a child's wheelchair. I have a four star baby with ginger hair, and I'm wearing a dark blue um, club with white wool pattern on it. Had to say was 
very much a, a shared sentiment of mine and many other people in the community. And so when I got to see it fully realized for the first time, um, it was just beautiful and um, I just felt very special to be a part of such a noir and glamour, um, creepy moment. Having her insert 
her script into it, which is exactly the collaboration that I wanted. Um, we had a, a third partner in the president of Little People of America, Mark Covinelli, who consulted on the script and gave me lots of great insights on how to make our sets accessible, which just opened up like a whole new way of thinking about filmmaking because film is really the perfect industry for accessible sets and being inclusive because think about the things that we do for celebrities every day. Like I have personally sprayed a perfume trail for somebody who had to walk the set only smelling Chanel. <laughs> we can do great things. We can make sets inclusive. Uh, and I, I just can't thank Katrina enough for being so patient with me. At the same time, she really kept me accountable. And she would ask me repeatedly, why are you telling this story? What is it about this story that you have to tell? And I hope that that has been answered in some ways in the film, but it's changed uh, the way I want to make art. Because every, everything I do now, I think, why? Why am I telling this story? Why does it matter? And thank you all so much for being here. It's amazing. Thank you to each of you for sharing your responses and much, so much sensitivity, thought, and care came through in the storytelling. Um, and you know, there are so many lines throughout that resonated, but Sylvie's uh, in particular, when Sylvie said, nobody wanted to see me, they just wanted to stare. Um, that really was so powerful, and I think the use of the camera was super great. The, was a great to uh, be in on this work and career. And really the ways that non-disabled people in particular have had the power and the way that it was important, they um, cultivated ideas and perceptions about disabled people um, and certain ideas of disability in the public spaces. So I'm curious to hear um, your thoughts on what ways does this film contribute to the legacy of disabled people, the great success, who have really had to advocate to fight for, uh, to, to become part of the public life, and why is it important at this moment uh, for us to be to draw attention to that? And Katrina, I'd like your, your talk to not have been more perfect to this question at this moment. I kind of agree with something that you said earlier, which was, um, I think the end would have loved this movie. <laughs> um, I think she um, would be somebody um, championing, you know, kind of the reasons why do we do the things we do? Why do, why is it that everything that connects humans really at the root of it all is that we all feel different and we all feel like an outsider? And I think that, um, because this is a period piece, it allows us to take our uh, current ways of thinking and apply them to the fact that we didn't have the language then, and that Hildy and Dan didn't have the ways to express why they felt different, why people exploited them for being different, and um, you know, I think that in my life, uh, my uh, pride and joy has always come from um, changing people's minds. And I know that it's not a task that I can do alone. So you have to really find people that are in your tribe and in your um, circle of awareness for how they want to progress society and conversations. And sometimes that has to be ugly and scary in order to achieve that. And um, I think that uh, finding Lindsay and other people that were a part of this film was super important to my journey um, as an actress and a performer. And um, I enjoy many different artistic mediums. I also went to film school. So uh, this was a treat for me to be a part of because I think it furthers a conversation about dwarfism. It furthers a conversation about um, Deanna Arbus, who I was obsessed with in film school. Um, so I really hope that, you know, one of my goals has always been if there's 
one 15-year-old out there that Googles for Googles dwarfism. You know, that, and, and finds this movie, um, that is like the whole reason for me and like behind my decisions of like what I want to do with my work. And, um, Cause I remember what it was like being that 15 year old and, and Googling little person. It was not pretty. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I just really hope that that's sort of the last idea. Uh, in terms of the timing that this movie comes out that you mentioned, I think Crip Camp was recently came out right before we started filming, like a month or two before, during the pandemic, and that was a guiding light for film, images, editing assemblies, um, the kinds of conversations around images, and people being in control of their own cameras and images, and then 2020 was this unschooling of so many intersectional uh, records and ableism has sort of been, I mean, it's something that happened at the time, obviously, and uh, it's the largest minority group, but it did feel like it was getting its due attention when we were having so many other conversations. I hope that it has come at a time when we are all eager to find ways to be more inclusive and to, uh, celebrate all these different parts of ourselves, that this becomes something as common as how you introduce yourself. I think that's a, a great way to start. Um, I think one of the things that really marks Diane Harvest's photographs is that um, the freaks stare back at you, and so in some ways they are unsettling because they take the power of the gaze away. And Rosemary Garden Thompson, who's a um, scholar, a, a group scholar, has written about this power of the gaze and the stare, and um, and how it how it is often used to um, dehumanize us, um, to reduce us to just uh, objects, and to have the ability to stare back is incredibly powerful. I think what Katrina made. What made your character, Cody, so powerful is her ability to stare back at the anime in the movie and to articulate herself so strongly um, and to regain this notion of who you are really, you know, as a, as a subject, you know, in, both as a subject of a photograph, a, a subject of a movie, and then as well as a subject in, in the ability to the Asian to my thought, your performance was really amazing. Um, and so, and I, it's interesting, I, 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 again, I think we can really focus on this notion of that gaze um, so much more, and, and her, in, in the final step, right, yeah, her own eye is turning into the eyes of, of the camera, um, being replaced by the, lenses of the robot. Um, I thought that was an interesting twist. Um, the, I mean, I'm such a camera geek, though. There's one thing I have to, I have to get this geek bit out of me. Okay, she's using a twin lens re reflex. A twin lens reflex, one of the lenses is the viewing lens. Um, and it, it is what the, the photographer sees. And the other lens is the taking lens. It's the camera lens, and it's what the film sees. And there are two lenses in the twin lens reflex. And so the geeky part of me was machinating in my head, what is this difference between, between the sort of taking lens and the viewing lens? And how does that reflect on, on, on the gaze and the ability of the camera to steal or not to take and so forth? So I, I apologize, I had to get that. that. Oh, I forgot to use uh, images like my t-shirt says, how does one uninstall anxiety? So um, <laughs> that's definitely a really good thing. Like such an amazing geek thing to geek out about. Thank you for saying that. Um, because yes, you're right. You obviously know a lot about cameras. I hope that uh, one level of how that could be interpreted is Deanne wanted to capture two levels of everybody. Um, it's 
what you publicly present and then what you're privately seeing yourself as taking and giving, and uh, whether the image that Deanne is holding of herself for what she is, the self-portrait she's getting from Hilly in that last scene. I think so many of her images are about that duality of, of taking and giving in one, one piece. Um, yeah. That's great, thank you. No, and that's why I like that they, 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 uh, she took a look at his name. Yes, yes. And Hilly's gaze, uh, all of this should feel like Katrina staring down at this piece of film that's just running past her. So I feel like whatever you're saying, I need to write it down and <laughs> make it a PR package. Uh, so thank you, yeah, for actually keeping all of us with you. Um, I love that moment, and there's so much with it, so glad we keep going to all the layers and show we can, like not get to um, all of it. Um, but there are for me, there were two moments when um, it, it directly comes to them when the bodies are other and when the, um, they're constantly being successful for distraction. And one of them is when Ian says, Did you ever feel like something else was taken? Something besides the photo? And then it's the Dr. Moby character who says, Real art is feeling what people don't see for you to see. Um, and that one of the experiences that marginalized communities will go through on the day, right, is that violence of having your humanity erased and broken from it and taken in from you. And your agency is not really well, having your own self autonomy and self direction. Um, so we can hear also about the one response star in terms of what role that this film and others like it um, it have in that. Solidarity with folks who are leading the justice and doing the justice work in the film industry and in academia. Um, I think it's so appropriate we're doing this in the Asian Art Museum because I kind of feel like Dr. Mowgli represents like um, the, the British Museum. It's about white colonial power and what they can take. Um, and the photographs, uh, the colonial photographs of, of people that are, are, are taken, literally, and the objects are things that are taken, literally. And here in the Asian Art Museum, I feel like it's trying to create something different. What is coming from the community and what is being um, produced? And I like that metaphor you had of, of taking and giving. And here, um, it really is about community production. Superfest is about uh, community production. It's very obvious this film came from the community and, and the art of the community. Um, and, and so I think, we, yeah, I wonder if you got the movie there and, and say that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I was going to say, uh, yes, I did uh, tackle Hildy as a character that somebody that was taking power back with the small amount of freedoms that she was given at that time. And if you think about what it was like to be a woman in that time period, um, was it the 60s? Um, you know, there are still in ways where women could not travel alone. Women could not sign their own checks. Um, all of that was still illegal, and so to imagine this woman having what little uh, autonomy she does have over herself, and how important that is, and how she's really, really gonna put her foot down about that. And um, I've always tried to uh, lead a similar path, because I feel that, you know, um, and this is so corny, but you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And um, that was something that my parents taught me at a very early age. And they were like, if you want to see a change, you're going to have to explain to people how the, um, it needs to be done right. And um, I felt that this movie also encapsulated a lot of themes that throughout my life, I've thought were really interesting in terms of the fact that people in, um, with dwarfism were like 
very much uh, idolized and given positions of power in many ancient um, mega cities. And a lot of people don't know about this history, but a lot of it was removed and erased and became a joke once colonialism actually um, was taking over these cultures. And, uh, you know, sort of, it just basically became a larger conversation between like, how, what is your worth inside of this capitalistic, able-bodied view of society. And um, I've, since this film, have been able to work on and really keep my eye out for other projects that kept a similar theme. And I'm so glad that this project has taken me into that just deeper and more like fully realized like outlook on um, art. And I think that, um, you know, people tend to forget, like, little people uh, in our community, our images are so overexploited that people think that they can speak for us or that we need to be spoken for instead of actually asking, like, the real deep questions about how we're the size of a child trying to live a normal adult's life. So, um, I've since been fortunate to work on a couple other documentary narrative features that are speaking uh, from the perspective of people with dwarfism inside of portraits. And there's hundreds of years of civilization of uh, the past, you know, thousand years of royalty that have court dwarfs in multiple societies. And it's just very interesting within other projects to get to explore what were those people's lives and what is the story that they're telling and how, what is our community become like since then and how are we sort of like taking ourselves out of that. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's really interesting to see that the gaze has been flipped and I love people's reactions to realizing that they actually don't have power over the dwarfism community. It's just um, a lie that they tell themselves um, because we actually have to figure out things in a very different and um, just completely different way than how most people view the world. And, October is also Dwarfism Awareness Month, and an amazing resource that I have learned so much from is Katrina's Instagram, uh, at Queen with a K. We'll make sure people have this. Um, Katrina's Instagram. And recently, you posted about uh, images and people taking images of people with dwarfism without permission. An incident happened recently where. Uh, I, I no, it happens every day. It happens every day. <laughs> happens every day. Um, but yes. Katrina's power behind the camera is so powerful because I know that's part of the experience. Um, people taking pictures without. Permission. Yeah, and, and we did talk about this when making the film was how important it was to have those uh, shots from the camera that you don't normally see with people um, that have work is up in a film. Usually it's. Uh, either this like insane like above angle or this very like you know grubby like down below level and so we sort of talked about how important that was to make sure that there were shots that were completely eye level to me just like there would be other people in the film and I understand that has to change based on horror and everything but um, yes very much that like let's focus on what what is this person seeing so that um, viewers watching Hildy could also be seeing like through her vision and how important that is uh, for me and, and the dwarfism community. And um, I've heard some people, uh, I, I haven't really heard anybody like, you know, argue like her attitude or anything like that. I think if, if anything, it's like, um, you know, uh, 
sitting in that uncomfortability is sometimes good for us. And um, it's really good for able-bodied people to start asking themselves questions. And um, then I think that starts them to ask questions larger, like on a societal scale. But I have been doing photography lately and I love shooting in 35 millimeter and Polaroid. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of that because I think uh, it's so fun and so important to me to show um, some of my subjects and muses that do have morphism. Um, I love to splice them with their adaptive tools and my love of just erotica and burlesque and um, I, I've been also a member of the circus for many years and um, that's another thing in the dwarfism community that is sort of like a 50-50 like people either love it or you know and it's their job or they hate it and they think that if you're a little person working in entertainment you're working against society like and all this stuff but um, circus and photography and sex work and all these things and just vaudeville, all of it sort of goes hand in hand. And so there's many, many, many people in the dwarfism community that are adjacent to these um, jobs that with all of this just whole world. And um, I think that Deanne would have been there too. Um, and uh, I'm also somebody, I just want to say, I'm uh, somebody dwarfism that is not afraid to answer people's questions. Um, especially, I get them all the time just on the street, but I'm gonna tell you that not every person with dwarfism is the same. <laughs> and um, I think everybody here knows that. But uh, yeah, so I, I love to answer questions from what I know, and um, I love to learn from other people with disabilities and dwarfism because I too um, am on a spectrum of able-bodiedness that I also recognize and understand that there's things that I've just put up with for years without um, expecting it to be different when I knew that it should have been. And um, so I'm doing the work I feel like projects like this to really change that up in my own life as well. I have Can I ask a question? Whose um, idea was it to change Hobie's character to be a projectionist? Because I find that uh, such a strong metaphor as well. In, in the short story, she's just at a bar, I believe. Correct. Uh, Karen is referencing the original short story which was written in 2016 and uh, as part of a master's program and it was not intended for film. And in that story, she doesn't even have the name Hildy, she's nameless. And she is in a bar and she's sober and she's hiding in the corners. And all of that is based on things I have read from this Hollywood Reporter article about people with dwarfism dealing with alcoholism afterwards. Uh, and then the namelessness just made sense at the time. A lot of it made sense at the time, but when I was putting it to film, again, 2020 was such a formative year. Four years, so much had changed, and the script, I mean, the story was good, but the script had to be so much better, and she needed a name, so I gave her my grandma's name, because that was the most important name I could think of, and she needed a job, and it needed to be a job that was visually interesting, but also symbolic and functional. So I played around with actress, director, playing something around cinema, but to be physically in control of what an audience is seeing made the most sense. And I love cinema, so I wanted to see somebody in that room. Um, several other changes from the story, but thank you for pointing that one out, because giving her an identity, uh, again, I'm glad that the story worked the way it did, but for Katrina to come on board, I needed to make it the best it could be and give her something really neat. And she's cutting and splicing the film. She learned how to do that, for real. She learned how to run these 35 millimeter projectors, like ancient, in a million dollar theater. She's splicing for real, she's cutting for real. 
She's hiring. <laughs> I actually had a professor in college. I went to California State uh, University, Northridge, and um, I actually had a professor who built a miniature enlarger table for me and everything that really changed my life. Um, and <clears throat> I was able to learn how to develop and create my own prints in the dark room and would work in there for hours. And so when I found out that Lindsay wanted to like really take it to the next level, I was like, she's a filmmaker that sees that if you give a task to your performer to do homework, it will create an authenticity that, and, and that is something that drives me up the wall about disability in cinema where I'm like, you clearly have the ability and the uh, wherewithal to incorporate those things and teach somebody um, accents, languages. Freaking look at you know anything on HBO Max. And it's like these people. Oh, I've been studying for three months in a room with no windows. You know, it's like a whole thing. And so I'm like. That's literally what I did though, it was during the pandemic. I, I locked myself in a room and was watching interviews of disgruntled uh, performers from the Wizard of Oz tour <laughs> and taught myself how to splice the film. And um, it was a blast, it was, it was fun. And um, so I feel like that very much added to it and it added to when I was learning the dialogue, working on the dialogue, and so. But I feel like Tony would have made like, um, like um, unauthorized edits to films. It's like we made two scenes of it. So Karen, you were saying earlier that in the context of where we're at, which is being an art museum, where it's like, and I fully agree with you about the character of in the British Museum. Um, and so I think the bouncing off of that too is that over the past one year since the pandemic in particular, we've seen an increasing uptick of violence towards um, our elders in uh, Chinatown across the country and then the Asian community um, has been experiencing a lot of work in this year. Um, and all of this is you know, we can trace it back to you know, the history of uh, white supremacy and, and the way that it's reflected in this film has so contributed to this. Um, and the way that the white gaze has continued to otherize and to make these ideas of what is acceptable and normalized. Um, and I think you were getting to this part of the discussion just now is so how can uh, practice and the way that you all collaborated um, continue to be the practice to ensure that we are being a little bit more critical of our media consumption and that it's not the norm, right, where we have people who would open to that, to, you know, writing the monologue and taking that and understanding why that was so important. Um, uh, this festival is a great template for how to ask questions of the people you're working with and the audience that you're hoping shows up. So normally you would ask a film crew for their lunch, like are you vegan? Do you need a uh, special camera on set? It's so easy to just add on to those questions. And I will probably use SuperQuest's emails as a template for this going forward. Do you need something that makes your job easier for you to perform? Do you need uh, something that makes it easier for you to use the bathroom, to get the crafting table? I mean, it's, so, it's really simple. And um, creatively, doing your research on a character should be like at the forefront anyway. And how lucky I've been to find someone who's willing to like really dig in with me and be so patient with me. Like Katrina mentioned, it's not her job to teach me. Um, she's very generous with her time, but it's on me to look what's available and to research. And then I've just been very lucky to find a friend who's, who's given so much. So, generous for this. So, I think logistically, super simple, 
creatively, um, research first, and then it just makes everything so much better.
And that means that the complexity of the story is needed to be at a higher level. They can't just be, you know, hey, a disabled character. They have to have that complexity. And I think through the years of watching the Super Press, we're really getting to the level where conversations have become richer and richer and richer each year. There are so many stories in the disabled community. Disabled people on the Constitution are incredibly creative. Every day we have to come up with new hacks to figure something out that the world wasn't uh, designed for us. Um, we have a, such a complexity of, of in, within our intersectional ideas, uh, identities. And I think we're starting to see this, but what's the other thing that Holly mentioned is it takes it takes a certain level of power in the community to actually start to create that. We need resources, we need people with, with the skills. And we're getting to that point um, where you know super fast is an experience some year. We have a, a plethora of really amazing disabled actors, so people can no longer say, well, I didn't have you know, I had to digitally put in a disabled act because I don't know where to find someone, or I had a, a seeing person play a blind person because I don't know any blind actors. And they can't use those excuses anymore. Um, and so I think we're getting to that point where I think exponential growth is really going to happen. But it's because we have venues like this where we can showcase, but we can also criticize and gently control. And I know, you know, you haven't seen the film as a juror, um, I can safely, a pastor, I can safely say there's so many bad films out there as well. But the gently, general controlling that the directors like Emily and, and Patrick before her do a pure class of just educating the audience. You didn't make the cut the next year, hey, what is this thing called uh, actually talking to hashtag actual disabled people before you make the film? You know, why don't you think about how to do access from the beginning um, when as you're writing your script and all of these other conversations I think are really important. The film industry has such enormous power, but there are other channels that we're going to that are, are able to speak back and make that and then so you know, in a small way as a juror, I just be so proud to be part of this and I'm just so proud that Superfest is is um, where it is now. Um, so, as I end my uh, final question, I just want to remind uh, both the audience and the people in that kind of work, one uh, question from the audience. Um, so, we have a client that would be great. Um, but I do want to wrap this conversation up with a quote from J.C. Bob, um, which says, activism can be the journey rather than the arrival. And I think that that is the truth, like the theory of Films that have been shown at some event um, for me in this conversation today. Um, and I guess just to end, I'm wondering if uh, each of you could share how this is going to contribute to your own ongoing campaign with work, maybe give us a hint of what you're working on next. Um, yeah. Uh, Dan would have loved to support us. I think uh, you're touching this earlier. She, her photos are so powerful. They don't pity. There's no virtue signaling. She's not trying to be any kind of lens of a savior. Uh, and I think that's an important contribution to the ableism conversation. I hope that my work going forward can do that too. And uh, it's, I think that requires a lot of conversations and a lot of um, help and, and being open-minded and being willing to be wrong making this film felt like a risk in a lot of ways and I was really afraid of being wrong. Uh, showing it in any audience, I just sweat the whole time and worry about it. <laughs> I'm so proud, but it's a, it's a very vulnerable thing and this pushes me to be more vulnerable and I hope that my future projects, which are all kind of dark and twisty, are, uh, are still willing to be risky. Um, my day job is as a university professor, and one of the things I've been pouring a lot of energy into is the UC Berkeley Disability Lab. And our motto is um, making better trips. And you know, it's a it's a lab that's by, you know, run by and for disabled people. Um, our goal is to create a better disability community. People who are empowered and kick ass, and you know, won't say no and. Won't, won't 
just do incredible things or just create a place where you don't have to do incredible things, where they can just be. Um, so that's that's sort of my goal is how do we make these like, like a bubble of our community so that you know we can we can essentially speak back to all these forces that are trying to press us. Um, so whether it's creative, technological, political, social, you know, those are things that, that I want more energy into. I am a reactionary at heart, <laughs> and I, I love um, shock and awe and uh, twisting people's perceptions um, of what they think that people are capable of. Um, that's always been a huge draw in my work, and um, I'm just an all-around Creative. I love uh, DJing, I do tarot reading, and I involve a lot of my obsessions with mysticism and uh, just obsession for pop culture with uh, everything that I love and do. Um, like I said, I've been doing photography and I sell those portraits um, currently right now through a gallery called Mikasa based out of New York. And um, I DJ different uh, clubs in Los Angeles and New York as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm always auditioning. Um, and I've just, over the years, have become more uh, picky about these roles. And uh, I really am a uh, soldier for intention. And I really felt the attention behind these characters when um, Lindsay brought them up. And I think even Hildy might have like, been a mother or something at one point. And, and that was like an interesting like headspace to um, work with. And um, I just, I love people keeping people guessing. And, um, just like mystery behind how something is finally achieved and like finished and like how it all came together. And it's messy behind the scenes, but the magic of no one knowing any of that going on because you just in a thank you spirit. Um, and it's just in a, um, a way that you can have fun. And I love, um, yeah, I'm just a very, very passionate individual, and um, I can feel that, that energy here very much too. So thank you so much for having us too. Um,